Good, good evening, everyone. So my name is Mark Schrege. I'm a program officer here at the Global Center for Pluralism. I just wanted to let you know the event will start very shortly, and we will be bringing a few more chairs. So those of you standing, you'll be able to sit down in a few minutes, all right? Thank you. Excellencies, Minister, friends of the Global Center for Pluralism, je vous souhaite tous une très chaleureuse bienvenue au centre ce soir. Nous sommes ravis uh, de vous accueillir en si grand nombre. Et je devrais tout, tout d'abord reconnaître que nous nous sommes réunis sur le territoire traditionnel du peuple algonquin. My name is John McNee, and I have the great honor of uh, directing this center which began uh, years ago with a proposal from His Highness the Aga Khan to the Government of Canada uh, to create a center dedicated to promoting pluralism in the world. Our mission really is to understand the dynamics in diverse and divided societies, to share that understanding with others, and to generate awareness of the benefits of diversity in society. Notre thèse, en effet, est très simple. C'est que dans le monde contemporain, la grande majorité des États euh, ont des caractéristiques de diversité, soit ethniques, religieuses, euh, culturelles, linguistiques ou raciales. Et si cette diversité est accommodée et valorisée, il y a de meilleurs résultats. Mais par contre, uh, the flip side holds true too that if diversity is seen as an element of weakness, as a problem, you get the potential for discord, strife, civil war, and at worst, genocide and Rwanda. So the stakes are pretty high. Um, thinking back over the past decade, there have been some very encouraging developments. There's been a diminution of, of ethnic conflict as governments have found ways to accommodate minorities. Tunisia, uh, the shining example of the Arab Spring, where religiously minded Tunisians and those of secular frame of mind found a way to navigate their differences and come up with a mutual, mutual respect and a new constitution uh, um, uh, based on democracy. At the UN, the Uni international community is signed on to the Sustainable Development Goals, whose, whose underlying theme is the importance of inclusion, which is a kind of close cousin uh, pluralism. But at the same time, we recognize some very disturbing trends. The rise of, intolerant, of an intolerant and even xenophobic populism, hostility to refugees and migrants in, in response to the, refugee, the global refugee and migrant crisis, and elections in the Americas, in Asia, in Eastern Europe that produced authoritarian-minded uh, governments and that open up the specter of the consolidation of illiberal democracies. So all this suggests a rise in popular discontent. This evening, we are very, very fortunate to welcome the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Christian Freeland, and Hugh Carnegie, senior editor at the FT in London, who are going to help us understand these phenomena and maybe suggest what can be done to counter some of the negative trends. Um, Christian Freeland really, really doesn't need an introduction tonight. I would just say that you know she had a, a very impressive first career as a journalist and as an author, as a foreign correspondent in Ukraine, as Moscow bureau chief for the, for the FT, and then in a su succession of, of senior uh, editorial roles 
Reuters, The Globe, Financial Times. And as we all know, she's been an extremely activist foreign minister with, I think, a very rare ability to analyze uh, issues and to articulate um, the values and the interests that impel Canada's involvement in the world. So we're, we're thrilled to have her with us. And she's joined, as I said before, by uh, Hugh Carnegie. I think you've probably deduced that they work together um, in, in the leadership of the Financial Times. Um, and Hugh also has a very distinguished record as a foreign correspondent. I can't even remember all the places he served, but certainly Dublin and Stockholm and, and uh, Jerusalem, and latterly as the Paris Bureau Chief for the Financial Times. Now, there are two other things you should know about Hugh. The first is that he's a Scot, which gives him a, a very um, important and, and different perspective on the dynamics in the UK and Europe. And equally important, uh, he spent summers as a counselor at Camp Omic in Algonquin Park. So we consider him almost a Canadian. So all this to say that I, we're thrilled to have them both. I'd like them to invite them up to the podium uh, for a dialogue on these issues. And afterwards, we'll have an opportunity uh, for questions from the floor. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for coming along this evening. First of all, may I say a big thank you to John and all the staff at the Global Center for uh, coming up with this idea, for setting it all up, and uh, setting the stage for what I hope will be a really uh, good discussion. So thank you, John. Can I also say a huge thank you to Christia for agreeing to come along this evening. Uh, as John said, we were colleagues for a number of years at the FT. In fact, I think we had, we had adjoining offices uh, at one point. And Christia was the deputy editor. I was one step down on the pecking order next door, but we worked very closely together, and it's absolutely thrilling for me to, to see Krista again and to be here together and to uh, have this conversation uh, with, 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 with her and with you, because uh, we will open this up for questions. Um, my role at the beginning, at least, is to set the scene a little bit. Uh, we're discussing the rise of popular discontent and what we can do about it, so we're going to try and keep that focus on, on what we can do about it. But I thought I would start a little bit with um, uh, a quick run round, a uh, sort of tour d'horizon of where we are in Europe. Not exhaustive and hopefully uh, fairly quick and, uh, quick and dirty, we might say. Uh, uh, and uh, as John says, I've come from the front line. It uh, tells you something about what's going on in Britain at the moment when somebody who's uh, sitting in London watching the Brexit. Uh, drama unfold is described as being on the front line. Uh, but there we are. So, we, I mean, it is a moment, I think, in Europe of unprecedented upheaval. I was thinking um, back to 1989 and the early 90s when Christia was covering uh, Russia for us, uh, brilliantly, by the way, our youngest uh, ever um, uh, Moscow bureau chief at the time. Uh, and it was a, a, a period of astonishing upheaval too. But there, I think, you know, there was a sense of optimism and hope, and it was you know, good things were happening. Now we're unfortunately somewhat uh, in, a, in, in the reverse, and we're in a, in a situation where there's a lot of kind of anxiety and fear about where all this is leading us, and political institutions, national institutions, international institutions uh, are coming under uh, enormous amounts of pressure, and it's very disturbing and unsettling, and it's rippling out, uh, and we don't quite know how it's going to end. So if I start very quickly in the UK, uh, before you ask, I don't know what's going to happen, <laughs> and, and nobody really does, and that includes Theresa May, uh, and I'm, you know, I don't think uh, anybody, anybody who pretends to tell you what's going to happen uh, it does, it, it's, telling, it's telling a lie. <laughs> but what I do know is that it is uh, an astonishing uh, uh, period. Uh, we have not, uh, you, know, you could say that the British political system is being tested to destruction right now uh, following the vote. And just to sort of give a flavor, um, there was a kind of palpable shock on the night of the vote. And ever since then, uh, there has been this terrible sort of sense of a, sort of a huge cultural division in Britain. You're defined now by which side you're on. Not long after the vote, my nephew got married, and I arrived uh, in the countryside in Norfolk. And I arrived, and my sister said, I made a joke to my sister about Brexit. She said, no, 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 shh, don't say anything like that. Don't talk about it. And Because it, it turned out that the bride's side and the groom's side were on different sides of the fence. And she did the seating plan to keep us apart. So that gives you a kind of idea. So, 
So that's where we are, and I don't mean to be flippant because it is actually deeply serious and we don't know quite how it's going to turn out yet and no doubt we'll talk more about it. So moving to France, where I worked for several years before uh, the Gilets Jaunes, but um, in a funny sort of way, France is UK in reverse because France elected Emmanuel Macron as this great hope and those of us in Britain who were kind of on the Remain side were going, ah, oh, you know, where's our Emmanuel Macron? This is brilliant. France has been sensible and, you know, this man who has this... You know, message of inclusiveness, of developing European uh, in, uh, integration and, and, and aspires to all the values that, that we would like to aspire to and to reverse the tide of, of populism uh, has been elected. But then France turned around and gave us the Gilets Jaunes not very long after, which is kind of like their, their, um, their, um, their sort of hit back from, from this popular discontent. And then if you just run very quickly round... We've had the rise of the uh, alternative for Deutschland in, in Germany. Now, because of the coalition between the two main parties, is the opposition. You have a right-wing party which is very against a lot of the values that are in, espoused by the, the center of the global center uh, as, the, as the official opposition in the Bundestag. That's pretty, um, you know, when you stand back and think about it, that's pretty amazing. Italy, of course, we have the, the government of La Liga and Five Star, La Liga very aggressively anti-immigration. They are going locking horns with Brussels on, on, on many issues. Uh, they're fighting with uh, their French neighbors. Uh, Spain, a little bit more complicated, but uh, their election result on, on, uh, on, on Sunday was not as kind of gloomy as some people thought, but nonetheless, you have, since the, for the first time since Franco uh, was deposed, you have a, a, a kind of very strongly nationalistic right-wing party in the form of Vox. Hungary and Poland, you know, we've had to coin this phrase of illiberal democracy uh, because of uh, the policies that have been uh, pursued there. Again, <clears throat> really quite a confrontation with what we had come to think of as core European values. Even in the Nordic countries, where I also work, um, in Sweden, Finland, you have parties that are um, very aggressively uh, anti-immigration, very you know, verging towards the nativist, uh, who have uh, won significant uh, places, uh, uh, seats in Parliament, and are in, almost in the role of kind of kingmakers when it comes to government. Sweden, just to give you a sense of the sort of topsy-turvy nature of it, the Social Democrats managed to get themselves and a majority in Parliament to form a government, but they had already been a vote on a budget that was put together by the right of centre party. So you have a Social Democratic Party having to enact a right of centre budget in order to fend off the insurgents of the Sweden Democrats who are from this uh, sort of anti-immigrant right wing. So lots of upheaval. And absolutely, we agreed. One thing we very quickly agreed before we came in was not to forget Ukraine, and we certainly wouldn't forget Ukraine. But you know, the, the election of uh, Vladimir uh, Zelensky uh, is, you know, how could you write that script? Um, and I'm not going to try and explain it, because I have somebody here who will explain it to you much better. But so this gives you, as I say, a very sort of quick run, run around the houses. Now, there are common themes that, and this is where we sort of try and pull this together. Um, my colleague Gideon Rachman wrote recently that Brexit is the British version of a wider crisis. Um, so we are seeing disaffection uh, bubbling up on, on sort of at least three fronts. There's, there's economic disaffection. There's the whole issue of... Uh, uh, Inequality of outcomes, uh, in inequality of incomes, indeed. Uh, you see, for example, at the Gilets Jaunes, it's very clearly the, uh, uh, the rural, the small towns and the rural areas revolting against the more prosperous cities. Um, on the social front, we've already obviously mentioned immigration and the, and the rise, the, the, the revival of a kind of nationalism in Europe, which I think is very stark and, and very... Uh, remarkable and worrying. And then uh, on, the, on the political front, it's this, again, it's this sort of anti-elite. The traditional parties uh, are no longer trusted. Indeed, they've been exploded, never mind fragmented. You know, if you look at France, this, the two parties who governed France ever, you know, throughout the Fifth Republic, uh, the socialists on the one side, obviously, and the, and the right of center, whatever it was called at the particular time. But you know, those two parties have have been almost completely wiped out, and they are really struggling to find any traction. So that's the, that's the sort of background in Europe, and obviously this isn't a phenomenon that's confined to Europe, uh, as, as no doubt would go on. 
So, and the last thing I think that just to tee things up that we, we should uh, look at is the role of you know, what you might call the information revolution and the whole kind of um, digital distortion. Um, I'm trying to avoid the, the, those two words. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, the, but, it's a, but it's a massive issue. So, now, way too much for me. So, um, so Christian, to kick this off, I thought, you know, a sort of quick sort of double question almost. Um, what's gone wrong? I mean, I, I, I wonder if you sort of share that kind of very uh, sketchy analysis. And, but more importantly, you know, what are the prospects of kind of restoring uh, political imp impetus to uh, a politics of, you know, pluralism, diversity, inclusiveness, um, the international order, which I know that you have, you know, was the feature of your, your, your now famous speech uh, to, to, to Parliament. How do, we, how do we steer away out of this, do you think? Okay, well, that's, you started off with a real softball, Pete. Thank <laughs> you for that. Um, so let me just start by saying, John, thank you very much for hosting us. Um, Hugh, bienvenue au Canada. Merci. Ça me fait un très grand plaisir, grand plaisir euh, de t'accueillir ici chez moi. Euh, et ça me fait un grand plaisir ici de voir beaucoup de mes collègues de mon département et aussi beaucoup de nos ambassadeurs. Merci beaucoup. Uh, and I do have to admit uh, that finding the time to be here tonight is in many ways an entirely self-indulgent act. It was an excuse to spend some time with Hugh, um, who is a, uh, a, was a truly wonderful colleague and is a truly wonderful journalist. So thank you very much. Um, look, Hugh, um, one of the things, um, and this um, may surprise people here, it may surprise you, Hugh, but because journalists are actually like fun people to hang out with. Um, I think it's one of the reasons I became a journalist. Um, but the job of journalists is to be kind of dyspeptic in their world view. You know, a journalist is supposed to be skeptical. Um, you don't really, like at the FT you're allowed to be sometimes a little bit optimistic, but generally speaking, you know, don't the good Martin, story, <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to him in a minute. You know, generally speaking, the best story is not, Everything's great today. That's not going to be your headline. Um, politicians, on the other hand, part of our job actually, I think, I think good politicians, part of the job actually is to be hopeful. Um, I think leading with hope is extremely important. Um, so uh, perhaps due to uh, the chairs we now sit in, I'm a little more optimistic than that tour d'horizon that you offered, which really, if we listened carefully to Hugh, I think we would all have to slit our wrists. Um, and I think the European ambassadors, and pretty much all of them are here, like that was a pretty tough report card that you just got <laughs> from the Financial Times. Um, so I'm a little more optimistic, actually a lot more optimistic, but I totally agree with um, you know, the essential diagnosis you've presented. Um, and I think you've zeroed in on kind of, you know, the core problem of our times, or certainly one of them, which is something that I think surprises a lot of us, has been a surprise, you know, for a lot of exactly the kind of people who are in this room, which is a seeming loss of faith in liberal democracy among the greatest beneficiaries of liberal democracies and in the countries that built both the post-war rules-based international order that benefited from it and who have had the strongest liberal democracies in their own countries. And like that's the shocker, right? Um, that in those places, in our places, people are saying, well, it's not maybe working that well. And I think you're quite right to point to that fact, that there are some real doubts. Um, what do I think uh, is the cause of those doubts? Um, so as is established here, clearly already today, I used to work for the Financial Times. Um, that tends to give you a world view which is quite economically deterministic. 
Uh, and I do think at the end of the day, the single biggest driver of what so many of us are experiencing is at the end of the day, our liberal democratic societies have for the past 20 or 30 years not been delivering that well for a lot of our people. Uh, the middle class has been hollowed out in all of our countries in varying degrees. The geography of that hollowing out varies in all of our countries. But that is a key economic reality. And to kind of rub salt in the wounds, that has happened at the same time that the global 1%, known to you, Hugh, as your readers, um, have, uh, it's true, it's true. Um, you know, those guys, and they're mostly guys, have been doing better than ever before. And, you know, we should not be surprised that people are saying, you know what, this really isn't working for me. And I need to try something different. Um, I would add to that, and relatedly, I think that in sort of the past couple of decades, the people of Western industrialized democracies have had some very specific reasons to doubt in the sort of omniscient powers of their elites. Uh, and I would single out as two of the biggest issues uh, the financial crisis of 2008, which kind of you know, particularly focuses one's attention on the hollowing out of one's own economic life and prospects. Uh, and also makes one question, are those, you know, technocratic elites really so great at running things? Um, and then the second thing I would say is the war in Iraq. Uh, not so much, uh, not an economic issue but a really big one in terms of are the people who we have been electing really the right kind of people to run stuff. Um, and so I think that at the end of the day, the reason that you know big groups of people in Western industrialized societies are questioning the way their liberal democracies were run is because liberal democracy, the way their liberal democracy was run wasn't really working for them. And so in some ways, this is kind of how democracy is supposed to work. People are saying, you know what? You weren't delivering results. And if you can't deliver results, I'm going to try something else. Uh, why am I ultimately hopeful? Because I think liberal democracy actually is the best way to deliver better results for exactly the people who are dissatisfied today. And it is the job of those of us who believe in liberal democracy, first and foremost political leaders, but also all the public servants here, and I would even say journalists too, um, we have to come up with better answers and better results. Do you think, though, that um, this, is a, th this goes structurally actually quite a lot deeper in the sense that um, in your own book, uh, Plutocrats, pointed out that these trends have been developing for longer than, you know, than the, the financial crisis. It, be, it began beyond 1970s, that. 1970s, probably. I, I mean, I was I, in the airport at Heathrow on, uh, on Saturday. I was looking for some you know, sort of homework-type books to read before I came over for this session. And I didn't find very much. But what I did hit on was, in the bestseller list, a book by Yanis Varoufakis, his um, sort of epistle to his daughter. I don't know if you've seen it, about capitalism. And he says the market is an oligolip, oligolip, horrible word, oligolip, oligolip, conspiracy. <laughs> and, but no, what, and what, the point I'm, making, the point I'm making here, apart from the fact that I can't speak, is that uh, you know, maybe this is a, a kind of crisis of social market capitalism. And I, I'm, you know, I'm going to continue to be the, the skeptical, gloomy journalist. Where it's hard She's actually a lot of fun. In <laughs> it's hard to see what the solution to that is right now. I mean, in Britain, we have Jeremy Corbyn, who's calling for a you know, dramatic swing to the left, which is, doesn't appear necessary. Well, we'll find out. But uh, you know, there's a lot of doubt about that. So 
you, the, the, if, the liberal, if liberal democracy is going to get wheels again, what is going to be in the, what's the engine? So, I will, you know, I do think um, this question about the economy and capitalism is a really important part of it. Um, and, you know, I'm tempted to start my answer, Hugh, um, by reminding us all of that great Churchill line, that democracy is the worst system except for all the others. And I think I would say the same thing about the market economy. Um, as you know, I have a particular perspective because I actually lived in the actual Soviet Union, not post-Soviet Union, actual Soviet Union. My children find this astonishing. They knew I was old, but they're like, really? You were alive then? I lived there as a student. I lived in uh, Kyiv in 1988, 89. And I have to say, that was like the best vaccination against any fantasies about how central planning is the solution to our problems. Um, they really, they spent a long time, the Soviets, trying to make it work, and it really didn't. It was terrible, and terrible not only in the restriction of liberty of people, but just in the material lives of people. I still remember, you know, when they had sausages and butter in the gastronome, we students would all like tell each other and we would leave our classes to go line up. Um, so this is not really a good alternative. And I think it's really important to say that to younger generations who maybe don't remember so clearly. Um, having said that, I think it is absolutely right to be clear that 20th century, 21st century capitalism is not working well enough. Um, it is working extremely well as a machine for delivering ever higher returns to the 0.01%. It is working extremely well as a winner-take-all economy. But I think there are some real structural issues in the ability of 21st century capitalism to deliver a comfortable, secure life to the broad middle class. And failure to do that will mean failure to sustain democracy, because democracy really is only going to work when the broad middle class in our societies is not only prosperous, but secure, confident about the future if people feel they can retire with dignity and comfort, and they feel their kids are going to get a good shot. Um, what do I think the problems are? Um, I think there are sort of two aspects to it, um, broadly speaking. One is, I think it's a reality actually of how, you know, of the combined uh, and mutually reinforcing forces of globalization and the technology revolution to create these very powerful winner-take-all cycles. Uh, and we see, it in we see it in particular industries where increasingly you have to be the top company or the second top company and you get the lion's share of the gains. We see it in professions where the people at the very, very top do a lot better than everybody else. And I, I think that there is something structural that is driving that, where you know the combination of the technology revolution and the ability to scale and the network effect which is multiplied by globalization, because now you can scale over the whole world, it just is tending to create these sorts of forces. And I th think, so that's sort of the first kind of structural issue which is there. I think we shouldn't be naive uh, and overlook the fact that there have been political decisions which you could take or choose not to take, which have tended to further reinforce that tendency. And those political decisions have tended to be influenced by the winners. And the winners, you know, the more they win, the more political power they have, the more they're able to push us more in that direction. And to give you one example, in order to be a little bit less abstract, unions. Uh, I think one of the things that, you know, both academic research and experience of all our countries has shown is where you have strong unions, workers are able to, you know, get a bigger share of those returns. 
Um, and in countries where unions have been weakened, you have even more powerful winner-take-all tendencies. So that's one reason I'm very pro-union and our government is really pro-union. Um, but hang on. Yeah. But then there is, just to be quick, I'll, I'll finish quickly, Steve. Um, so there are those sort of structural forces. Um, and then there are political decisions. And I think we have a delicate balancing act because I certainly am not a Luddite. Uh, and I am not an advocate of autarky. So I think, you know, speaking for Canada, um, we don't want to stop the technology revolution. Um, we want to be really, really good at it. You know, that's why we're very proud of our prowess at AI, for example. Um, we don't want to stop globalization. Canada wants to be even more connected with the world. So if that is the case, and if you believe, as I do, that there are some structural characteristics of globalization, the technology revolution, which are going to tend to lean in the direction of more inequality and of hollowing out of the middle class, then I think what you need are political solutions. And I think you need, you know, politics needs to take on itself a responsibility for ensuring that you know, the 21st century capitalist engine, the great growth and prosperity, which it does deliver. And, and, you know, that's another thing to remember. Like, we actually have more stuff and are better at producing stuff than any previous generation. In a weird way, it's part of our problem is that we're able to produce stuff so easily. You know, my dad is a farmer. He's 74 years old. He farms 6,000 acres, and it's my dad and like two or three other people, and they're not even there the whole time. It's just at peak periods. Think about that. And in a way, it's great because that's why food is so cheap. In another way, that's a lot of jobs that don't exist. I go to a lot of factories now because of my job, Hugh, and I actually used to at the FT as well. And you know, I was recently in uh, the Sioux, and I went to Algoma. And it is striking how few people there are now making steel, you know, one of those like quintessential industries of the industrial age. So it's not really so much a problem of the economy isn't able to produce the things we all need to live in comfort and prosperity. It's that we're not very good at being sure that all of us get enough of the fruits of that. And what makes it particularly challenging is I think none of us want to stifle innovation. So we want to find a way to be innovative societies, to be societies that embrace the technology revolution, even as we are societies that know how to share. Yeah. And that's really a big challenge. Yeah, I, and we probably don't want to get completely bogged down in, in economics, but nonetheless, it's, it seems to me that the logical kind of conclusion of what you said is that we have to look hard at essentially regulation uh, in, in, in its broadest term and that maybe what's gone wrong is that we've we've not regulated in a way that has or rather we may need to have a kind of regulation uh, chain a regulation upheaval in the way or, or revolution like we had in the antitrust in the famous antitrust day in terms of the tech companies we, we may need to look at our taxation structures very, very carefully. Uh, and these are very hard, very hard things to do. And we may need to look, I think, at corporate governance. There were very striking figures out a week ago from the US which showed that the median CEO pay in the United States, the ratio to the median worker in the company was 254 to one. And that was just the meat. And the, 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 there were famous examples, the Bob Iger of Disney 1,424 times the salary of his median worker. So, and th that's where it gets crunchy because that's hard politics to do, it seems to me, to, to break up the tech companies or to regulate them in a way, to really get them to pay taxes and to, and to have a tax structure. You know, Thomas Piketty said, well, let's tax at whatever he said, 70%. Uh, when Francois Hollande tried to do that in France, uh, he got in terrible trouble. I want to offer two thoughts about that. Um, and I agree with, I'm actually going to offer three thoughts about that. I think you're exactly right. Um, 
And the first thought is that parallel with the trust busting era is a very good and important one, partly because it's hopeful. You know, I think one of the things that's important for us to recognize, even as we look at the challenges which we face, which are formidable, is to remember human beings have faced something pretty similar before and figured it out. You know, I think the challenges of 21st century capitalism are not dissimilar to the challenges of late 19th, early 20th century capitalism. You know, the parallels are kind of eerie, actually. You know, you had a technology revolution then, you had globalization then, uh, you had tremendous amount of innovation, tremendous wealth being created, but you also had a rise of a super elite and a lot of people being hollowed out. The good news about that parallel is, at the end of the day, we all figured it out. Uh, we had, in our different countries, different versions of the New Deal. You know, we created social safety nets. We created a way to share the prosperity of the Industrial Revolution with all of our people. And we kind of, you know, invented liberal democracy properly in that process. So that's the good news. The bad news is, before we figured it out, we had to live through the First World War, the Second World War, the Great Depression, and the Bolshevik Revolution. So let's hope we can figure it out more quickly this time and without the midwife of trauma. Um, but it can be done, and, and I think really the challenge is very comparable. Um, the other thing I would say, Hugh, about the political difficulty of the challenge is I think part of the answer uh, needs to be getting the winners in society to really understand that a solution is in their interest too. And uh, I represent a riding. Uh, you know we call them ridings yeah. in Canada? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, so I represent a riding called University Rosedale. And Rosedale is one of the most prosperous neighborhoods in Canada. Um, it is a place where the Canadian 1% lives. And so I had the experience in the election in 2015 of knocking on doors in Rosedale and saying, please vote for me, I'll increase your taxes. Um, and I actually won't, and actually I'll cut the taxes of almost everybody else, but your taxes are gonna go up. And I had, I had a lot of very interesting conversations during the campaign, but there was one that really stuck with me, um, which was beautiful Rosedale House, nice seeming guy, nice guy, uh, was like taking care of his garden, and we were talking, his lawn, and uh, he said, you know, I've done the math, and I think if you guys win, it will cost me $30,000 a year, um, both in terms of taxes, and then we clawed back some benefits um, from people at the top. Uh, and so he said, I kind of like you guys. I really like Trudeau. Uh, I sort of think you would be a better government, but like $30,000 a year, that's a lot to like pay just because I like you a little more. Um, and what I said to him was that really it was in his self-interest to vote for us. Obviously, I'm a politician. Um, but that the things that we were proposing were in his self-interest. Um, because I live in my riding, and there are really good public schools. My son, Ivan, who we were talking about, goes to Cottingham Public School just around the corner from my house. Um, the, it is not a gated community. Um, people can live there, some of Canada's most prosperous people, in what I think people from some other societies might feel was almost a 1950s or 1960s type of community. And that costs money. Um, if we want to live in that kind of non-polarized society, in a place where we don't have to lock the gates against our neighbors because they feel, you know, because they are struggling so much and they see us doing so much better, then we do actually have to spend some money at it. And I actually really believe 
uh, that for very many people in Canada, but also in other countries, that's a price worth paying. And in a way, the sort of divisive populism that you've been describing, Hugh, it's kind of proof that what I said to this nice guy in Rosedale was true. You know, that failure to do that, failure to pay what it costs to keep the middle class feeling secure. Um, the end result, maybe you'll be a little bit richer, but you are gonna live in a crummy, crummy society, which is really scary for you and scary for your children. And I think we need to be prepared to make that argument. And look, like this is a pretty prosperous group of people in this room. You know, we need to also be prepared to act on that because it's really true. And I, I think spending a little bit more, paying a little bit more so that our compatriots can be comfortable and secure is totally worth it. Okay. I just want to, before we finish up and open up to questions, I just wanted to get into one more subject because I think it's, it's particularly relevant in the, uh, on the agenda of the Center for the Global Center for Pluralism which is the, the whole um, uh, sort of rupture over immigration that we're seeing um, on this side of the Atlantic as well as obviously in Europe. Um, something, you know, we, I think in Britain we became rather complacent that we were building a truly kind of integrated society that, you know, partly because those of us that believed that were probably spending too much time in London and not enough time outside, uh, outside the, the city. But, it turns out that there are you know, very visceral feelings about immigration at large in society at the moment. Um, maybe that they, will be, they would be taken care of if people started to feel a little bit better off and that they had opportunities and that life was treating them better. But is there something more there, do you think, that we need to pay attention to? I do think that part of it, a big part of it, is about politics and choices political leaders make. Um, I think when you have a middle class that feels insecure, um, that is a group of people, a group of voters, um, who can be um, talked to and offered two paths. One path can be a hopeful path. This is how we can make things better. Another path can be a path of anger. This is whose fault it is. And, you know, that path of anger is a pretty tempting path for a lot of politicians to take because it's easier to point the finger at who's to blame than it is to talk, especially to talk in sound bites about how you make 21st century capitalism work. I mean, we've just been trying to do it. It's really complicated. Um, complicated issues can be hard to talk about in politics. I think they're less hard than some people think, but it is hard to do. Um, but what we know and what we are seeing a lot of people in the world doing effectively is identifying a group of voters who are insecure and anxious, whipping up that anxiety and targeting it. And the easiest targets, not the only ones, um, but the easiest targets are someone else, are the other. The easiest target is someone whose skin is a different color from yours and who's a different religion, maybe an immigrant, or maybe a trading partner. We know those guys as targets also. Um, so I do think politics is part of it, for sure. Um, I also, though, in talking about pluralism in a diverse society, as a Canadian, um, I am always really conscious that we're just so lucky. Um, history uh, has generally been pretty great to Canada. Um, one way that the combination of our geography and our very particular history uh, has been great to Canada is it has sort of made us a country almost destined to welcome multiculturalism and diversity. Um, 
uh, even David Goodhart, another former colleague of ours. Um, David Goodhart, who is a former colleague of ours, is sort of the famous coiner of the phrase, the somewheres and the nowheres, right, um, that Theresa May used. Um, and he was actually at my house for New Year's Day a couple of years ago. And he said to me, you know, I just, you know, Canada's just special. <laughs> you know, you guys don't fit into my overall scope. <laughs> I think he even wrote that in a prospect essay. There was kind of like a, an asterisk. This applies to the whole world except <laughs> Canada. Um, and, you know, it's, we've had some of these unique historical factors for a long time. There's a great speech um, by Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the founding speech of the idea of multiculturalism which he delivered in Winnipeg at a, at a meeting, one of the annual meetings of the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress. So there's even a Ukrainian-Canadian angle here. Um, and this was this founding idea of Canada as a multicultural society. And you can read the speech today, and although Canada has changed a lot since then, um, it reads very true to today. And one of the things he says in that speech is, there is no such thing as sort of the, quint the archetypal, the quintessential Canadian. There's no one language that you can say a Canadian speaks, for example. And that, was such, that is such a powerful and important thing about us. So I kind of want to offer a little bit of Canadian humility there. At the same time, though, I'll just say two more things on this pluralism stuff. Three more things, quickly. Um, the fact that Canada kind of works as a diverse society, I think is really important for those of you who are not Canadian and are with us to see and tell your friends about back home. Because I think there are some people today who are arguing that it's just not possible, that there's something maybe in our genes, in our DNA as human beings, that we just can't be a successful diverse society. And I think Canada is a really successful, diverse society. And I actually think the rising generation is even more that way than we are. Um, I eavesdropped uh, on a recent family walk on a hilarious conversation among my three children who decided that they were going to have a contest amongst themselves as to who would end up marrying the most diverse person. <laughs> and they had also hilarious was their discussion of who would constitute the most diverse compared to our family, which was really sort of funny and interesting. And I swear, like, I didn't prompt them to do this or anything. It was just like their own thing between the three of them. Um, and that's kind of amazing that Canadian kids are talking about stuff like that. Having said all of that, I'll say two more things. I do think uh, one of the things which is really important if you want to be a society which is open to immigration, which Canada is and I very much want us to continue to be, is people must have confidence that we control our borders. It's very important in a democracy for the, the citizens of that democracy to feel the choice is theirs. Um, and again here, Canada is lucky because of our geographic position. Um, you know, we're proud of welcoming, you know, now more than 50,000 Syrian refugees. It is nothing compared to what Germany has experienced, Sabine. Um, and I do think, you know, particularly, you know, small L liberal politicians and governments, we have a responsibility to assure people that we understand it's important to control our borders. David Frum recently wrote um, a really interesting article about immigration where he says small L liberals have to take seriously people's legitimate desire to control their borders because if small L liberal politicians won't do the job, then people will elect fascists to do the job for them. And I think that is well put. But a final thing I'll say to you, which I really experience traveling around Canada, is I think a lot of Canadians get the reality, which is immigration. Like, I love living in a diverse society. For me, it's also just a personal preference of the kind of world I want to be in. But there is a very hard-nosed economic virtue 
in being a society which is open to immigration. And Canadians really get that. You know, I'm going to refer again to my visit to Sault Ste. Marie, where one of the things that the local uh, Chamber of Commerce was pitching to me was we have this um, sort of a pilot program which we started in Atlantic Canada to target immigrants at rural communities that need more people. And it's been so successful, it's being rolled out around the rest of the country. But not every community gets to be a community that gets more immigrants. And so they have to bid against each other. And this is actually a true fact. And the people in the Sioux were saying to me, tell Ahmed Hussein we really want to be one of the winners. And please tell him what a great place we are and how great we will be to all the immigrants he sends us. Um, and this wasn't any politically motivated. This was a chamber of commerce. And they feel that that can be a real driver of economic growth. Okay. Great. Now, I think we're going to throw it open to questions. Yeah. Not before time, Paul. Thank you very much for a lovely conversation. Uh, my name is Urban Alin, the new Swedish ambassador here in Canada. And before I came here, I worked in Parliament for 24 years, a member of Parliament, and ended my career as a speaker. So I recognize the discussion, and I must say I'm really impressed by the conversation because I think you are really spot on, on a, you know, in lots of areas. People do feel that they are left behind. They feel that they cannot ripe the fruits from the globalization, and they can see a rich elite you know, running away somewhere in the horizon somewhere. But let me add one thing that I actually think politicians can do something about. Okay. And if we look upon the southern neighbor, the American dream, I do think the American people do not any longer believe in the American dream. Once upon a time, they felt I have an equal opportunity to get myself rich and you know, be engaged in something and be the new Gates. And nowadays they don't believe in that. Lots of people believe the system is tilted. It's not only that the market economy is very fast and produces lots of wealth, it's I, the system is tilted. I cannot ripe the fruits from this. We can see the scandal in the United States about rich Hollywood actors paying their kids way into universities. I mean, all that creates a feeling of, hmm, the system is not fair. And I actually think politicians can do more to create equal opportunities and a more leveled playing field you know, in this market economy. So I would like to have some response to that. Thank you. Uh, shall we take another one here? You, you, uh, okay, right. Yeah. Yeah, and then we'll, yeah. well, we'll take three and then we'll, um, we'll turn it to our... Um, thank you very much. This is such a great conversation. Um, one question I have is... Um, Regarding the role of politicians to explain the complexity of the world, I think this is, has been a huge issue um, and which contributes to the discontent. Problems are very complex at this point and it's very difficult for people to figure out what is the right solution to this problem. And um, many politicians, um, you know, go for quick media talking points and snappy little, um, um, you know, slogans here and there rather than trying to really explain um, these complexities and why they've derived at the solution that they want to put forward. Um, so, yes, I would like to hear your thoughts around that. We'll take a, uh, David at the back. <coughs> Thank you also for the conversation. My name is Thomas Look. I'm also relatively new Estonian ambassador to Canada, and I survived m my first winter in Canada, so <laughs> it's already pretty good. Uh, but I would also like to, you know, bring a perhaps different, different sentiment and uh, and to say I also old enough to remember times back away and new times, uh, and I would like to say liberal democracy is a way to go, um, and I would say that. Uh, all nations who have opted for liberal demo democracy and my own nation have really benefited out of that. The question is uh, how we can engage all society. And um, not being a politician, but as a citizen of my own state and uh, traveling around a little bit, I think we need to get away with uh, a notion of uh, winning, uh, winning um, members of society, rich uh, or middle class, 
we need to keep in mind also that there are not everybody is winning, but the question is how to really have a cohesive society. So first point is really to get away with what, to do away with winning or losing, losing in one society. We want to really have a common society. Second issue that I picked up from discussion is that, uh, that there are of course new trends, technology. There is uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, and uh, people have uh, a legitimate uh, sort of concern about it. For instance, uh, RE, whether it's going to take away our, our working places or not, uh, or migration compact, for instance. Uh, and in that respect, I think uh, not only uh, this probably lies with politicians, but also with everyone, media, scientists. The factor of we need to enlighten the people, teach them. Mm. And, and you know, uh, uh, in this discussion, uh, I, I didn't hear anything about uh, the role of education. And I, w I would think really to, to cut my speech short is education is, so, is, is going to save the world. Uh, I want to have your context on that, your comments on that. Thank you. Shall I start? Uh, I think social mobility is, is huge, and clearly uh, it's, it, it's key. It's easy to diagnose, it's much harder to achieve, but I certainly think, I mean, picking up on some of the things we've already been saying, that uh, you ha we have to find ways of making people feel that they have a stake in our, in our societies and in our economies. Um, and it's complicated by things like technology, uh, and we also have got ourselves in a position where those people who are doing jobs that, can, that technology perhaps can't do, for example, care of the elderly and nursing and things like that, we have maybe undervalued. Uh, and so I think we need a long, hard look at what roles in society we value and how we reward them and how we redress the balance so that there is a sense, first of all, that there is genuine social mobility, and education is, I mean, I think you can link all these questions together because education clearly is a, is a key part of that because if you don't give people an opportunity to get a good education, particularly in our economies these days, then social mobility is not going to work. Uh, so you, you, you have to have that. So people feel on the one hand that they have the opportunity to advance and that their children have the opportunity to advance, but also that not everybody will be able to become a... You know, a, a, a tech genius, and, uh, and, and therefore you, you've got to make sure that there aren't people, to coin the phrase, left behind, that people who are doing what might be classified by an economist as a kind of fairly menial job still feel they have a value and they have a wealth and a position in society that can also be a springboard then for their children. That's, as I say, easy to diagnose, much harder to do, and I have a huge respect for people that are willing to become politicians and commit to doing it. Okay, well, thanks, Hugh. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with what Hugh has said. Um, I do think, Ambassador, one of the things I like about what you said is not that people perceive the system to be unfair, but that in many cases it is unfair. And I think it's very important more broadly in talking about the concerns of the middle class, the hollowed out middle class. You know, people sometimes say, you know, their anxiety, their perception. This is actual reality. You know, there are real economic numbers around what has been happening to people in the middle class broadly across Western industrialized societies. And so we, we have to be clear about that. And one of the things that, you know, exactly as the examples that you cite illustrate, one of the things in the winner take all society is the winners help their children become super winners. Um, and we are in danger in all of our societies of getting into a kind of Downton Abbey kind of effect. And I don't, you know, maybe you guys like Downton Abbey. I know, I know you don't, Hugh. But, you know, <laughs> speaking as a Canadian, we, you know, the ones of us who are not Indigenous who came here, a lot of us came here to get away from societies that were like that. So that's not the kind of society we want to live in. But I think it is really hard to push back against that. To connect my answer um, you know, to Hugh's point about education and the final question, education is so important and ensuring that access to education is very, very broad. Starting, I would say, from junior kindergarten is really, really essential. Um, I brought a few little favorite quotes to read in case stuff came up. 
And one of my favorites is from a Doug Saunders column. He is a great Globe and Mail columnist. Um, and in a column, a really interesting column he wrote about Brexit, he cited uh, research by a University of Leicester scientist who found that the most decisive factor, I'm now quoting Doug, in Britain's Brexit decision was not the age or gender of voters, but their education rate. And this is quoting uh, Doug, quoting the Leicester scientist, an increase of about 3% in the proportion of British adults with higher education in England and Wales could have reversed the referendum result in the UK. Um, and Doug points out, this wouldn't even require Britain to bring its higher education rate up to the levels of Canada, which is 10 points higher. You guys would only have to get three points higher. So I think that says a lot about this broader point, which is if we want to avoid the kind of really dangerous, divisive populism that Hugh has sort of, uh, you know, so magisterially described happening in a lot of the world, we really have a shared interest in making a lot of investments in our people. Um, but it's, you know, it costs money and it's difficult. And there are, you know, we are going to be leaning against, I think, what is in part a, a structural winner-take-all force in, the tw in 21st century capitalism. Um, and just in conclusion, I want to address the question of complexity. Um, thank you for asking that question because I think about it a lot. Um, and I think it is a really important one. Um, my, uh, in sort of uh, thinking about our conversation tonight, um, I think my kind of Rosetta Stones were to a pair of columns by your current colleague, my former colleague and very dear friend, Martin Wolf. Um, he wrote a couple of days ago, or a few weeks ago, maybe a column called The Rise of the Elected Despots. And then just today, he published a kind of a sister column to it, which is called The Politics of Hope Against the Politics of Fear. Um, and I'm going to claim a little bit of credit for that second column, because after he wrote The Age of the Elected Despots, I wrote to Martin, I said, okay, now you've made us all really depressed. <laughs> um, you have to at least come up with some of the answers. And so I urge everybody to read those two columns. They're really interesting. See advertisement for the Financial Times. Um, and one of the points Martin makes is that modern society, you know, these 21st century problems we're talking about are by their very nature complex. And they're going to require complex answers. Um, and Martin acknowledges in his column that that is a hard challenge um, for liberal democratic politicians. Um, and he points out, and I really agree with him, that it's tougher for those of us on the liberal democracy side because if you're on the kind of, you know, everything is rotten, tear down the house side of things, you don't so much have to offer answers. You can just, um, you know, stoke up that anger and point out who the villains are. If you're in the business of kind of offering answers, it is hard. Uh, and I would be the last person to claim to have a definitive answer to how to do it. Um, but I can tell you my personal starting point. And my personal starting point is Canadians are really smart. And I have a lot of faith in Canadians. I have a lot of faith in the people in my constituency. I have a lot of faith in Canadians across the country. And I really believe that it's okay to say to people, these are complex challenges we face. Um, it's not so hard to imagine and portray the kind of world we want to live in. But it's a little bit complicated figuring out exactly how to accomplish that. Um, and to say as a politician that what you can offer is to be honest about what the problem is, to be honest in your effort to work out solutions, and to be open and collaborative with Canadians about doing it. I think that's the best we can do. And I actually, I think Canadians know. 
And you know, all the people of our countries, I think they understand these challenges are complicated. And I think we need to give people credit and be honest about that. I'm, I'm conscious of the time and the clock ticking. Um, maybe we could take a couple more questions. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh. Well, we'll, front, front and center is the High Commissioner, um, wherever the mic is. I'm sorry. We'll, yeah. We'll here first. I beg your pardon. Oh. <laughs> well, okay. So we'll, were, you back, were you first? I'm sorry. There's a forest of, of hands. So we'll go to the Turkish ambassador, and then we'll go up front um, to the High Commissioner. All right. Thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you for a very interesting conversation. I'm the new Turkish ambassador. Uh, you spoke about immigration. You know, uh, we hold the world record with four million refugees now. Uh, Canada is very welcoming, but you have a very uh, regulated uh, immigration policy. Uh, I wonder what you think about the year ahead, uh, especially if uh, Idlib falls in Syria and two million more people hit the road and come to our country. I think that might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Uh, how that would affect Canada and how you see immigration in the year ahead. Thank you. And up, yeah, up front here, please, where's the mic? Thanks, Mario. Yeah. Excuse me, sure. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, my Indian colleague come after me. Um, I'm the British High Commissioner, and just to reassure you, I don't know what's going to happen next either. <laughs> Um, uh, I want to ask you a question as journalists, as a former journalist and a current journalist. Um, how far do you think uh, the press can be at least held partly responsible for where we are? Um, I think in the case of Brexit, there's a, there's a big question to answer about how, not in the honorable exception of the Financial Times, but as we know, not many of us <laughs> read your wonderful newspaper, how far the press has led us to where we are. Um, and second, what role can the press play in, or should play in getting us to where we need to be rather than where we are. So final question up front, the High Commissioner of India. Uh, I am Vikas Varud, the High Commissioner of India. So as we speak, the largest democratic exercise in history is going on in India, electorate of only 900 million people. <laughs> and the biggest problem I think uh, that we are facing in this election is fake news. So my question is, what do we do about social media? These closed echo chambers that have been created, uh, fake news which circulates, which even leads to lynchings of people. I mean, can it be regulated? Uh, what can we do about it? Yeah. Uh, sure, I, do you have do, lots do you of journalist ask? questions? Okay, no, I was just wondering about the Turkish ambassador's question, <laughs> not to forget that. Uh, well, thank you, I'll, why don't I kick off? Uh, I'm very glad, thank you for these questions, because I realized that I had not done my duty by coming back to the subject, uh, but now you've, you've allowed us to do so, so that, that, that's very good. Um, m media responsibility, definitely uh, the media needs to look at itself in, in lots of ways, in lots of ways. Um, just to talk a little bit about the media and Brexit for a moment, uh, obviously which I watched very up close. In fact, I was involved you know, right in the middle of it. Um, there, I think, there were a couple of things. One is, obviously, there was a, a, a number of newspapers, and they were newspapers, who took a very strong uh, anti-EU, pro-Brexit stance in a very aggressive way. And one of the things that that rather surprisingly revealed was that it turned out that the print newspaper still had perhaps more influence than we imagined, because we thought that with circulations halving in 10 years and, and so on, and the shift online uh, in terms of where people are getting their information from, that newspapers weren't really a, an important player. But it turns out that newspapers were important partly for an agenda-setting reason. In other words, they were seen as leading the debate to some extent. And I think, actually, and I'm not seeking to shift responsibility away as somebody who's a newspaper man, um, but I think broadcasters also slightly fell into the trap of picking up the agenda that was being set by these newspapers who, on the face of it, had rather small circulations and were largely preaching in terms of their own readers to the converted. Um, but yes, there is a responsibility there. I think it, the way I see the responsibility is, is, a, is a rather wider one, and it, and it speaks to the fake news issue. Um, and 
on a, in a number of, of different ways. Um, I was saying earlier today in a discussion with, with Mark here that uh, one of the reasons why the media did not pick up on things like um, the, the sort of insurgent uh, politics that have, that have characterized Europe over the last couple of years, and indeed Trump, is that we weren't speaking to the right people. Um, and the problem, I think, for a lot of the established mainstream media is that we didn't hold a mirror up to ourselves. We were too busy talking to ourselves. Um, if you look at the sort of structure of the media, we have become very, of the sort of, again, use the phrase mainstream media, we've become very dominated by college-educated people from the middle and wealthier classes. Um, and we weren't a proper reflection of the societies we're writing and talking about and, uh, uh, and reporting on. And that's, I think, something that uh, is a huge responsibility. Um, and if we are going to, uh, as I sort of put it at the beginning, find a new impetus for politics of inclusiveness and diversity, uh, then I think um, the media has to be able to really speak and spe speak to and speak for the wider societies that they represent and pick up on these, uh, on these trends and represent them so people feel they have a voice. Because I think we failed in that, to, to be honest. On the fake news thing, it, it, it's such a big and such a, um, again, complex uh, issue um, that is about... It could be about regulation, but it's, a, it's also about education. Um, and it's about instilling some sense of responsibility. Uh, and it's also about policing and security and being smart about catching the bad guys. Um, but for me, um, I think it's terribly important that we, you know, that we stick to a commitment to a kind of journalism that is committed to fair reporting and to finding the facts. Um, now, you know, famously, there's my facts and there's your facts now. But actually, I don't think we should just give up on that at all. I really don't. And I think it's terribly important, for example, when we're uh, mentoring and training our young journalists to make sure that they understand that, no, there's a, they have a responsibility to seek out the truth. Um, now, to some extent, it's, it's an aspiration. I remember when I was a young trainee at Reuters and we were discussing these very issues and a wise old bird said, look, objectivity is not something you're ever likely to attain, but you will be kept honest if you keep trying to find it. And I think it's that, that's a hugely important issue in the media and we've, it, it's very difficult now because the media is so diverse Anybody can be the media uh, in a heartbeat. Uh, and so those of us, I think, who are in the kind of core of the professional media have a huge responsibility, a huge responsibility. And, I mean, just very quickly on, on fake news, I think we do have to really uh, home in and deal with the issue of the responsibility of the platforms. Because as publishers of traditional news, uh, 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 news publishers like the Financial Times, we are held... Uh, liable under the law, and uh, and that's absolutely right and proper. You know, we can argue about whether the libel laws should be tougher or less tough, and so on. But we are we are responsible for what we publish. That is not that has been deliberately avoided by the by the tech platforms. They're still trying to dodge the issue for all the effort they uh, say you know that they are putting in, and they are doing better. But I don't think they're hardly scratching the surface. And there's a very very big societal issue there. Okay, I'll try to be super quick. Um, uh, to the Turkish ambassador, welcome. Uh, I am delighted to hear you say you think Canada is a welcoming society. Um, but I also want to uh, express a lot of humility towards Turkey, towards Jordan, towards many of the European countries represented here. Um, I do think it's so important when Canadians talk about diversity and pluralism and immigration, we do so with a very real appreciation of the fact that for geographical reasons, it's a lot easier for us. And you know, maybe I should say something I 
perhaps should have said at the beginning, um, there is a very big historical challenge which we haven't resolved yet in Canada, which is reconciliation with the indigenous people in Canada. Uh, and that is something that we're working on, um, but it's really hard and we sure haven't gotten it right yet. And I think you're very right to point to uh, an important aspect of uh, challenges in international relations. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we need to collectively work hard to support the safety and prosperity of all countries around the world is when things really break down, not only is it a tragedy for the human beings involved, but I think we have all experienced, particularly uh, Europeans, countries close to Syria, like Turkey, like Jordan, um, the hugely destabilizing effects. And, you know, I think you could have offered as one of the root causes of his European tour d'horizon, Syria. Um, and that is why, you know, for Canada, we certainly feel a responsibility to have welcomed a significant number of Syrian refugees because it's everybody's problem. Um, that is why we are leading uh, the NATO training mission in Iraq to offer a contribution to some stabilization. It's why in our own hemisphere, we are so focused on the tragedy of Venezuela and on supporting Juan Guaido as interim president. And it's chiefly because we support the democratic aspirations and the constitutional rights of the people of Venezuela, but it's also because we realize our own hemisphere um, could be subject to some of the incredibly destabilizing refugee flows um, that Turkey has experienced. Um, now, just quickly on journalism, three quick things. I first want to say one thing that would be interesting to Hugh personally. Um, on the point about needing to uh, be diverse ourselves in order to properly cover things, I think it's a great point. And the weird thing for me is I have never worked in such a diverse group as I do working in the cabinet of Canada. Uh, and partly that's a Canadian tradition because we're such a big country. We do have a well-established tradition of having ministers from across the country. Um, but our prime minister has really expanded that understanding to have created, I think, a cabinet that looks more like Canada than any other cabinet has done. And I have to tell you, just the experience of being around that table, you just learn so much more and have so many different perspectives brought to the table. You know, I think I, my colleague, our wonderful house leader, Bardish Chager, I don't think she will mind my quoting a really great thing she said at one cabinet meeting, even though it's cabinet confidentiality, Ian. She won't mind, I promise you, okay? Um, we were talking about, we were talking about racism and white supremacy and, you know, what did this mean for Canadians? And some of us who were white were kind of opining about meetings we had had with our constituents. And Bardish said, I'm brown. I'm a woman. I'm not that big. I can tell you how it feels to walk down the street. And all of a sudden I was like, yeah, she can. <laughs> we really better listen to her. So I think that is really true. Finally, two points on media. Hugh said many really important things, but your point about publishers' responsibility is something that I think we have to start bringing to the conversation of digital platforms. And I think sometimes, uh, and we had a bit of a conversation about this at the G7 foreign ministers, and sometimes we can act like the issue of what do digital platforms do with all this crazy stuff that's there, we can act like it's this incredibly complicated, difficult, impossible, how do you get your arms around it challenge. And we forget that old-fashioned mainstream media guys have been dealing with it for a really long time and dealing with it really effectively. It's hard. It's expensive. Hugh and I have both had the personal experience of being responsible for being the editor who signs off on that day's newspaper. I can tell you it's terrifying. I still remember Richard Lambert giving me a talk. He was 
a great storied editor of the FT before the first time I did it. And I remember him saying, be careful about the cartoons. <laughs> They're the ones that can really get you. Did he ever tell you that? <laughs> I didn't, but he um, should have. Right? So, and, and you have to worry about the ads. But if like old fashioned mainstream media guys who are not Silicon Valley geniuses, if like they're able to do it every day, then I think the Silicon Valley guys should be able to figure it out too. And by the way, they have, a, you know, yes, it's expensive. The last time I checked, they had a lot more money than the old fashioned media guys do. Mm -hmm. So let's not act like this is a bigger intellectual problem than it actually is. And then finally, Susan, to your point about journalists and responsibility, I agree with what people have said, but I do want to end on a note of pointing out how hard the job journalists do is, that journalists today are facing a lot of danger in a lot of countries around the world. Um, we are at a peak of journalists being killed for doing their jobs, of journalists being imprisoned. You mentioned Reuters. Two brave Reuters journalists are in jail in Myanmar. Um, they do an absolutely essential job. As a politician, I can tell you, like, I've actually experienced knowing reporters are going to ask me questions. It makes me do my job better because I'm scared. I'm constantly scared of journalists. And, uh, I know that I have to have good answers to their questions. And it makes me try to do better. Uh, and so let us also really not forget that we've been talking about liberal democracy, how important it is. A vibrant, independent media that aspires to do all the great things Hugh was talking about is absolutely essential to a functioning democracy. And we need to be grateful to the hardworking, experienced journalists like my friend Hugh Carnegie who make that possible. Thank you. Thank you. So on, on that great note, I wanted to thank you all very much for being here this evening. There have been, and some of you are faithful, uh, there have been many very interesting conversations in this room, but I think none may be so probing or so optimistic in the end. So uh, I'm, I'm hugely appreciative to Hugh Carnegie, who's come from London, uh, to join us, and to the minister who had maybe a few other things on her mind today, um, but you wouldn't know it uh, from the, the care and thought that she put into her comments today. So. Uh, encourage all your friends to follow this on our website. Um, those of you who are going to be in Lisbon on June 11th, come to our next event in which we'll have the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, Amina Mohammed, who is fantastic, uh, talk about pluralism and development. And again, a huge thank you to both the Minister and to Hugh. Thank you very much. <laughs>